Thank you very much, Lisa. And let me say good evening to everyone again. So glad that we can get together and, and study God's word. It, it's, a, it's a joy to be sitting at the table and feasting on the word of the Lord and, and learning some of the important things he wants us to understand from his word. Before we go into our study, I would just want to preface um, our session by indicating to those of you who might begin to feel a little overwhelmed by the, the depth of the material that we are studying and might be wondering to yourself, well, can I be this sort of Bible student? Can I engage myself in the depths of research and study of the word like this to be able to understand some of the, the difficult doctrines of the word? Is, is that the calling of, of God on the life of, of every believer? Do we have to go into the depth like Reverend Jackman or other persons would do in order to engage us in the study of the word. Now, I say don't let that be a thought that overwhelms you because in, in the kingdom of God, God gives different interests and different abilities to individuals that we all work together for the building up and the edification of the whole body. So as Brother Boyce would have been teaching in some of his sessions in relation to spiritual gifts, how the church functions, we don't all have the same interests and we do not all are not all called to study in the same depth, but we would just need to make ourselves available to individuals who would have studied in, in that sort of a way that we are enlightened because God would have equipped those individuals to help us to understand the word and get a better grasp of it. Just say, for example, I would not be inclined to to study Greek and Hebrew in any significant significant depth in order to be able to, to, to translate Hebrew and Greek into the English. But there are people who God will be quick to be able to do that because that's why we were able to get the Bible translated from, from Hebrew and Aramaic to our language and from Greek to our English that we could understand. So there are people who are gifted in that and there are people who would have been called by God to to develop um, that sort of interest and, and, and skill and we benefit from it. So while that is not an interest that I would pursue, yet there are times when I have to look for a Greek word or, or Hebrew word to get a better understanding of what the text is saying and sometimes get a different interpretation based on the original um, language in which the, the text would have been written. And I would benefit then from those people who God will be quick to do that sort of study and have that sort of ability to use for the whole body. So that's the way we function. So, so, so don't feel that, you know, or look at yourself in a, in a less significant way because you might feel that you are not that knowledgeable or have gone into the world in that sort of depth. But you will benefit from, from individuals who will give themselves over to that because I was studying these sort of topics for, for many years, for over a generation now. And I guess some of the, the people of in my age group would remember the times when we would meet at Chapman Street when I was youth president uh, many years ago. And we would engage in studies concerning some of these topics. And it was a blessing to see how, be, how many young people would, would virtually fill the annex of Chapman Street and so enthusiastic and zealous um, for the study of the word. And they would really like us to, to recreate that sort of interest. So I hope that as we study these sessions, or, or we, as we have been studying these sessions for over the last um, 15 weeks, that you know, you'd have been motivated to want to know more, to learn more. And while you might not be engaged in that sort of depth of study, you will be motivated to want to learn and to, to benefit from people who have been engaged in, in, in that type of study that you can benefit by being able to understand the word of, of the Lord and have a good, clear understanding of the doctrine, position of the church that you are part of and be in a better position to be able to explain to someone who may need to have a good understanding. So that's how the church functions. Different people 
will have different interests and be gifted in different ways. And we all avail ourselves to being equipped by people who um, have more expertise and understanding in certain matters. So that's just where I fit in because I have been motivated by the spirit to be engaged in, in this sort of study, but I make myself available to, to share um, for the benefit of the whole body. And I hope that you have been able to understand things a little better, get a better grasp of our doctrine, but, but also get a better understanding of, of the word. Because as I indicated, it's not trying to defend our doctrine or our position, but it's trying to get an understanding of what the word of God really is teaching us as we seek to you know, go into it in greater detail. All right, so that's just a prefacing of, of remarks. So we want to get into our study tonight on Revelation chapter 20. We're going to be focusing mainly on the millennium, but of course the other things are going to come up in, in the study of, of that particular chapter. It's going to engage us um, for more than one session. We would have just read through it last week. And you know, there were a few things I threw out that you will give some thought to and requested that you read over the chapter so that you will be able to have some questions that you want to ask and anything that may be difficult for you to understand we will examine it together. So what I want to do first of all is just to give you a, a, a background of what is the prevailing view and the prevailing interpretation from Revelation chapter 20. And that would be obviously the premillennial view. We'd like to start from there because that's the view that is dominant and that's the view that most evangelical churches will hold fast to. So I will just give you um, a sort of short indication of some of the main points that they identify in relation to their doctrinal position so that you can reflect on them. And then as we go through Revelation chapter 20, you will examine what their teaching is in the light of what our understanding is based on what we see coming out from Revelation 20. So we're not going to try to superimpose our view or our position on it, but try to see precisely what it is saying to us and examine it in the light of, of what you know is the common view. Because if you if you listen, as I indicated already, to TBN um, station, you will hear most of these views expressed. So I will read from my iPad so that you wouldn't think that I am I'm just trying to figure out what their belief system is. I will be reading directly from some of their literature just to give you how they interpret Revelation 20 and what is their understanding and connection um, to other doctoral positions which would be sort of associated with their understanding of Revelation 20 because it is just not that chapter, because we will find that it connects to other parts of the Bible. Remember, I have tried, I've been trying to get you to understand that the, the Bible gives a, a sort of overall perspective, a narrative, a historical record, a, a, a drama that, that, that fits into a particular theme. And so we have to get all parts of it right so as to get a, a full understanding of what the word of God is saying to us. And if we miss um, specific parts of it and we don't get the whole, then we could find ourselves um, coming up with a doctrine that does not identify with the intent of the, the full word that God wants us to understand. All right, so I'm reading from the literature. So you listen carefully, I'll try to read slow and I'm going to identify some specific tenets of their belief system in relation to Revelation 20 and the millennial, the millennial teaching. And I want you to reflect on them because when we go through Revelation chapter 20, and I hope that you would have gone through it and perhaps you would have had some questions that you would want to ask or 
or give me your particular interpretation or understanding of some of the things you see in it so that we can work from where you are so that I will not you know, try to tell you things, but rather to engage your thought processes and your own hermeneutics and your own exegesis of the word so that we can see how together we can try to understand what we can gather from the teaching in Revelation 20 and other parts of the word where it connects. All right, for their doctrine, they say the millennium is the 1,000 year reign of Christ on earth after he returns at the second coming. During this time, Jesus will set up his kingdom in Jerusalem and people will continue to live on the earth until it is destroyed at the end of the millennium. Many people wrongly believe that the earth is destroyed when Jesus returns. That's what they say. The second coming is not the end of the world, but the end of the age. The end of this period as we know it. So their ushering in of the millennium then is, is another dispensation which is to come before the actual end of all things. All right, question they ask, how do multitudes of people get into the millennium? Only a few will enter the millennial kingdom at the second coming. Then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up year to year to worship the king. They're quoting from Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16. This verse, they said, indicates that most of the earth's population will be destroyed during the tribulation period before Jesus returns. All right, pay careful attention because we are going to be backtracking on some of the things that you were taught in previous sessions. So I'm going to engage you to see how much you remembered because a lot of their tenets are going to oppose some of the things that you were taught before. And I want to see if you can bring to bear some of those teachings that will counteract what their suggestions are in, re in relation to their particular interpretation. All right, how do lost people get into the millennium? Now they're asking questions and they're giving their answers according to the theology. They say only saved people enter the millennium. At the second coming, only the sheep, which is the saved people, and they're quoting out from Matthew, enter into the kingdom, while the goats, lost people, are cast into hell. That's Matthew chapter 25. Verses 31 to 46 that they're quoting from, the sheep and the goat. This means that the 1,000 year reign of Christ on earth begins with an entire population of people who have eternal life. They go on to say, by the end of the millennium, many lost people will be there. At the end of the 1,000 year reign of Christ on earth, Satan is loosed from the abyss and deceives the nations on the earth who try to overthrow the throne of Jesus. They are obviously lost people. Zechariah 14, 16 to 19, they are telling us that during the millennium, those who refuse to go to Jerusalem to worship once a year will be punished. And the question asks, why would a safe person refuse to worship Jesus? Obviously, safe people will look forward to worshiping Jesus, but those people who do not go up every year to worship in Jerusalem would obviously be lost people. How did lost people get in the millennium? The answer is simple. These are people born during the millennium. How can people be born after the second coming, resurrected people cannot beget children. And they will quote from what Jesus says, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given a marriage, but are like angels in heaven. This very verse will work against their theory. People will be resurrect with resurrected bodies, won't be able to marry or have children. At the rapture, every Christian will receive a resurrected body Therefore, we can't be involved in repopulating the earth. 
Only people in their natural or resurrected bodies are able to produce children. The earth population will be drastically reduced because most people will be killed or raptured before Jesus returns. And the earth will need to be repopulated. Jesus referred to the millennial kingdom on earth as the regeneration, which means, that's what the interpret it means, repopulation. Many children will be born on earth during the thousand year reign of Christ. That's what they believe. Who are the parents of these children? The parents who give birth to these people are those who were saved after the rapture and are still alive in their natural bodies at the second coming. This is the reason the rapture and the second coming of Christ cannot be the same event. If the rapture happens at the same time as the second coming, all saved people will have resurrected bodies and there will be no people in natural bodies to repopulate the earth. At the rapture, all safe people will receive resurrected bodies and will be taken to heaven. Everyone left behind on earth, not taken in the rapture, will be in their natural human bodies. Many of these people will be saved and will live until the second coming. These are the people who will enter the millennium in their natural bodies and will repopulate the earth. All right, I am going to stop at that point. So I'm reading from their doctrinal stance on how they interpret Revelation 20 and how they understand the millennium. It's a literal, physical reign of Christ on earth for a thousand years. And they have identified a number of things that they see that will happen during the millennium. So I want you to reflect on those things and you talk to me, engage me, and how you view their particular perspective in the light of some of the things that we were taught before when we were looking at the overall picture and what we are being taught from Scripture in the New Testament and in the Old Testament in relation to how the end comes. If you can't give me any questions in relation to that or any comments, I hope you'll be able to give me some in relation to Revelation chapter 20 as you would have read it and some things would have come to your mind. What are some of those things that would raise your interest or that you would want to question to get further understanding and explanation of? So I'm opening early tonight for you to engage in some conversation with me and some dialogue. Do you see any issues with those statements which I just read from the, the premillennial doctrinal position, which as I said is supported by 70 to 75 percent of evangelical Christians in terms of the way they see the coming end of, of this world and what will happen in that period of time and how they view it? So I pause. So you talk to me. And don't be scared and don't be shy. And I want to engage you before we actually begin to look at Revelation 20. That's the general perspective and interpretation of it. Do you have any concerns with that? Now, there are a number of things that 
that should raise your eyebrows. That should be clicking in your minds in relation to some of the things that we have already discussed from the word. And we have seen some evidence from scripture that it, it can't apply to that particular um, doctrinal interpretation. Can you remember any of those things that were conflict with that particular view? If you can't, it means that you would have forgotten a lot of things that we talked about, and I hope that that is not the case. I know some of you would not have been here from the beginning of the study, and you might have missed some important things which we would perhaps need to reflect on as we go through this. But I know that there are a number of persons who would have been here from the beginning and would have been exposed to some things that I would have shown you from the word that would conflict with their views that were just identified. Good night, Robert Chapman. Yes. Yes, Brother Randy. Hey, sorry. Hey, I just tried this. I, I listened to some of the things. I, I just slipped away a while, but okay. that, 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 that thing that you read just now, mm -hmm. it really can't hold water according to your word. Okay. And why I say that is because if you, if you go back to the millennium, I remember you saying that that was a period that 12, 1,260 years with a period in the history where the church would have been through the great apostasy. Okay. Then if, if you go back again, you would have said that Jesus in establish his kingdom, say his kingdom is not of this world. Mm -hmm. And if Christ said that, how could I come now and interpret when I read that in verse in chapter 20 and say that the Christ will come to establish a, a kingdom of this world. Then he said before that his kingdom was not of this world. Mm -hmm. he, he did say that. All right. So, then, so that's one that's one of the holes that you were seeing in the theory. That they're yeah. they are talking about physical, literal kingdom, which does not add up with what Jesus taught about his kingdom. Jesus All right. So, so, mm -hmm. so I see that as one of the flaws in, in that particular theory okay okay that's how you see that all right any any other things that you spot that would be difficult in matching back with the word that we would have studied but as i said i i i slipped away a little bit oh, okay I, okay I all right you really heard that one bit, yeah right. so, but so we, that. Uh, yeah so we you leave know. some space then for other people who might have heard all the other things i said yeah All right, a question that comes to mind, let me ask you then in case you, you, you're not uh, picking things up. Does time continues after Christ returns? How many times does Christ return to the earth? Good evening, Reverend Chapman. Good evening. Um, I miss a lot of it, but I've heard you some of it that you read because um my my internet seems to drop out. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was thinking that um they mentioned about Jesus is going to reign mm -hmm. in Jerusalem. Yes. Is this if Physical Jerusalem, because for if, them, if, if so, yes, for them, be, for them, it is in, the, in their theory, it is physical Jerusalem. So that means that you are the only thinking he'd be only reigning for the Jews, because I mean, what about the people in the other parts of the world? Very, very important, because the question would be: Are people living in Australia and South America at the same time? And if you are expecting according to your understanding of Zechariah, that these people have to go back every year to Jerusalem 
to worship, these people are going to be coming from real far. And then they're punished, as you say, if they don't go up to worship because you're looking at a literal interpretation of these texts and you're expecting this to be fulfilled in a literal way. Then part of their theology too is that there will be a temple rebuilt in Jerusalem, which means that these sacrifices that were offered before will be reinstituted and that um, Christians will, will engage again in offering sacrifices in the in the same form that we were during the temple worship, which should have been abolished when Christ came to this world and became the ultimate sacrifice and the atonement for the world. But they would believe that that is going to be reinstituted. And I question that in relation to the teaching, the general teaching of the word. Okay, but Spooner, you can go on if you had other questions. Yeah, I was thinking also to that. Um... A lot of, a lot of um, what we've read in um, in Revelation twenty. Yes, I term it to be figurative, a lot of figurative um, metaphors, um, words because they, 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 they just can't add up physically. I just can't see how they can add up in a physical sense, a literal okay. sense. All right. Okay. Um, the All right. About, oh, tell, 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 thousand years. I mean, the thousand year reign, um, the Bible talk a lot about, there are many times in the Bible mention um, thousand. So for an example, um, mm -hmm. some is talking about cattle on a thousand hills, but that's not a physical thousand hills that you're talking about. That's right. And um, he also mentioned about um, a thousand years in God's sight as, as one day. Mm -hmm. And um, Peter one also, a thousand years. also repeated that. So that, that, those things are not literal thousands, but some people seem to hold on to everything that they read as just as they see it in the book. Right, which means that they have a literal interpretation of it. And that's one of the first questions that we have to answer. Is Revelation chapter 20 to be taken literally at all the things that are exposed therein? We have established the fact from the very beginning that Revelation itself is a book given to symbolism and figurative language, the book, the whole book itself. And therefore, when we're picking up chapter 20, we are picking up just a section of the book which continues that same symbolism, which we must understand and realize that it is not to be taken literally. Because if we take it literally, then it means that we are going to misunderstand the intent of the, of the passage because a lot of things are not going to add up literally. And then, as I indicated, when you are doing a proper exegesis of the word, you have to make comparisons with other parts of the Bible, other um, scriptures that also give an indication and understanding of what you're trying to grapple with in Revelation 20. The Bible must interpret itself and there must be harmony in the word because there's one picture, there's one narrative and it fits together and completes a whole. And therefore, when we're looking at part of it, we have to see how it matches to the whole because the Bible is not going to contradict itself. And we also said that one of the principles of interpretation is that we look for passages that are clear and simple to understand and let them help us understand figurative or symbolic language. And, and don't try to isolate the symbolic language and come up, or come up with a theory on it that does not match back with the whole or with other references from New Testament writers and even from the Old Testament, which will give a different um, interpretation because then you will be confusing yourself and, and make it look like the word itself is, is not a harmony and it is confusing. And really and truly it is not if we give ourselves the proper understanding. All right, I wait for a minute or two to see if anybody has any other reflections or any other comments that would have heard some of the things I say, or we can go on to look at Revelation 20 and start identifying 
some things which we need to understand and grapple with to figure out what is the word saying to us in Revelation 20. So Rev, we have um, either a question, a comment, or a query from Pastor John, Pastor Carrington. John yes, Carrington, Pastor, Pastor John. John. Yes. Hi, right, good night, brother. I'm Robert Chapman. Yes, I'll sir. Begin from what they said to understand that the dead mentioned in verse 5 are the same dead mentioned in verse 13 of Revelation 20. I didn't hear that question. Are we to understand from what they're saying? Yes. That the, that the dead mentioned in verse 5 of Revelation right. 20 yes. are the same dead mentioned in verse 13. No, and th their teaching will tell you that in verse 13 of Revelation 20, that is the great white throne judgment. We're only the ones that had remained in the grave that were the unsaved ones are going to be resurrected for the final judgment. That's their interpretation of that. So they would be seeing a different set of people in Revelation chapter 13. Because as far as they understand, remember that during the tribulation, some people are going to go into the millennial kingdom because they're going to get saved during the tribulation. And some of them are going to remain in the grave. Verse 13, sorry, verse 13. I said chapter 13, sorry. Verse 13, verse 13. Right. So, they, they see a different set of people. So they see a first resurrection and a second resurrection. The first resurrection occurs at the rapture and the second resurrection occurs after the millennium. Well, verse, verse 5 says that the, um, for the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years was finished. Right. That, that's what it says. But that's not that's not how they interpret that. Okay, thanks. Yes, that's what it says. That's why we're that's why we're going to examine what the word does say, because they don't say that. They see these dead here that are resurrected as the dead that are resurrected for the rapture. Okay, that's that's the interpretation of this particular part of the text. They see this as, re, as referring to the rapture when the, the dead Christians are resurrected to be taken to heaven with Christ for the great Mars supper of the Lamb. They are going to see a second bodily physical resurrection after the millennium, which they will say are only the unsaved. The, resurrect, the Christians were resurrected before and taken to heaven with Christ at the rapture and left the unsaved in the grave. And they are only going to be resurrected after the thousand year reign, which is the millennium. And that's what they was, would call the great white throne judgment. So, but, as I say, we have, we have to examine the whole. Does the scripture teach two physical bodily resurrections? No, that's the question. Does that the Bible teach of, that? That would be most confusing, Robert Chapman. Most confusing. <laughs> that would be most confusing. Because even if even try to wrap my head around what you've just said, if that is at all possible, yes, then, then a whole lot of theology is seriously wrong. That's right. That, that is the issue. That is the issue. When we examine their theology, it has to match back with the whole picture. You can't isolate parts of it and interpret it to suit your particular perspective when it is a part of a whole. And we have to get the understanding of the whole or else we will confuse our theology. So, so, so Brother John, you are already beginning to pick up some of the issues that we're going to have with their theological perspective when we examine the scripture as a whole. I think I, I saw um, a question there from Sandra, but I missed it. So, Jeff, do you see a question from Sandra, a statement? Sandra Pollard?
Yes, Reverend Jama, I answer for Brother Jeff. Um, she says, in Second Peter chapter three, says that the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, and yes. there will be a new heaven and new earth. Where are these people living during this thousand years? This is a very good question. Issue. That is a very good question because that is a question that is asked by the persons who oppose their particular theological perspective of a physical, literal thousand year reign on the earth. Where are they going to be reigning? But remember, the statement I read earlier, their theology said that the earth will only be destroyed after the millennium. So what they're saying is that Peter's statement is true, right? And we, we have another text from Peter, um, 2 Peter chapter 3, it says, the earth shall melt with fervent heat, the element shall be dissolved, basically. And, and we got statements like, like Jesus saying, heaven and earth, will pass away. So it means that the heaven and earth will pass away at some time. And then we have a, a scripture saying, as long as the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, summer, winter will not cease. Those simple scriptures indicate that this earth will not always exist. And that will bring us in now to when we are looking at the full consummation as to where we spend eternity. Is it on earth or is it in a, in a different place? But we, we, we reserve that for later. We're not going to discuss that now, but that is going to be an issue of concern when we look at the, the final consummation of when we look at eternity. Where do we spend eternity after all of, of, of the world systems and kingdoms come to end? But Sandra, you, you asked a very good question and, and, and you made a very good connection. Where are we going to spend a thousand year reign if according to the scripture, Things come to an end when Christ returns. Now, their theology would not support that view, but is that the correct theology based on the word that we have been given? And if you remember early scripture that I gave you um, from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul gives us a very good understanding of, of the resurrection and what will happen, mortal put on immortality. And this is an issue now for their millennium, because who are going to be reigning in the millennium and what sort of people are going to be reigning in the millennium? And then really and truly, what is going to be the nature of this millennial kingdom? This is maybe we'll go back to look at some of the passages from Isaiah and, and um, some of those references that we were talking about, about the kingdom of God and see how they interpret, them, interpret these scriptures in terms of their understanding of the millennium. But these are going to be critical questions which will expose some loopholes in their particular theology. All right, so let's start to, to, to unpack this and get down to the nitty gritty. And then we'll see more questions arising and that we need answers for. Now, first of all, the, the word millennium is, is our English word that we derive. Just like the word rapture, you would not see it in the text, in the original text. You will not see rapture or you will not see millennium. You will see the concept of a thousand years, but that comes from a, a, from, well, a combination of Latin words, mille, which means a thousand, and annus, which means a year. Annus is the, the, um, the Latin word from which you get annual or anniversary. And mille is the word which will represent a, a thousand. You get millimeters and milliliters and, and those sorts of things as, a, as the English derivative from the Latin. So millennium is a combination of mille meaning a thousand and annus meaning a year. So you get a thousand years. But the word millennium, you will not see that in the original um, language, just that you will not see rapture in the original language. You will see caught up to meet the Lord in the air, but that's the English word we derive. And so the word we have derived from the Latin is the millennium. And that is because we're talking about a thousand years. Now, when examining scripture, back to another principle, you, you have to look for what it says and what it does not say. Very critical. What the word says and what it does not say. Because very often you can formulate a doctrine based on your understanding, but when you look at the word carefully, it does not say what you are saying it says. 
and we have to look carefully at what Revelation 20 says. We have to bear in mind that we are looking at figurative and symbolic language, and we have to take that into consideration. Also, we have to bear in mind that we have recapitulation, recapitulations in the book of Revelation. Everything, as I explained to you already, does not follow in a chronological sequence. And I indicated previously that Revelation 20 is sort of recapitulating, recapitulating what we saw in Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 introduced us to the woman which we interpret to mean the church. Some people think it represents Israel, but I am inclined to believe it represents the church. It represents the church in its early form as the, as the kingdom of God is, is being established and, and the early Christians are establishing themselves. The forces of darkness are coming against the church in the form of the Roman Empire and also in the attack which is going to come from the dragon or the serpent, the devil, who is giving power and authority to the Roman Empire to destroy the church. Satan's aim, if we look at the overall picture, is to destroy the kingdom of God, to destroy the church that Jesus built. And he attacked the church from the very inception in the first century through persecution, through false teachings, in an attempt to destroy the church. But we see that the, the, the life of the church is preserved. The woman is, 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 is taken into the wilderness, but she is preserved. So in a nutshell, what Revelation 12 is trying to expose us to is the attempt of Satan to destroy the church. Revelation 20 is recapping that same effort. Satan's aim is to destroy the church and to come against the church. But the scriptures indicate that there is a process in place to stop him from accomplishing that purpose. And we're going to try to understand in symbolic way, interpreting the, the language, not literally, but figuratively, how we can get an understanding of what John is saying to us in this chapter. So we go through it. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loose for a little season. All right, we're going to stop there. There's a lot to unpack in those few verses. Let's get to it. Are we talking about a literal binding of Satan here? Or are we talking about a figurative binding of Satan here? One question. Are we talking about a literal thousand years? Or we are talking about, uh, as Brother Spooner indicated, a time period given which is not meant to be specific, but it is an indication of some sort of control or restraint exercise over Satan during this period of time. Now, we're going to look at some scriptures from the New Testament to help us to understand of the figurative way in which we can look at Satan being bound. Because if we are saying it is figurative and not literal, we have to have references from the word which will give us an indication as to why we can interpret it in a figurative way. So we will we'll look at that. Now, do you see the key and the chain as literal things being used to bind Satan, or are these figurative expressions that are used? Now, our theology believes that the thousand year period is not meant to be a specific literal 1,000 year reign. 
where Satan is actually bound for a thousand years. That period represents an extended time period, just like by the school indicated that we have a reference when God speaking about the cattle on a thousand hills. Does he mean a literal thousand hills? Because then when we get a thousand and one and a thousand two and a thousand three, don't they belong to God? And only a thousand? We talk about, we see the God talk about a thousand generations and, and things where a thousand is mentioned. Is he speaking of blessings only to a thousand generations? What about a thousand and one generation and a thousand and two generations? What the indication is here is that we use these large numbers to give an expression of an extensive um, period of time or an extensive number which is not limited by the numerical value of 1,000, but is meant to mean a long period. So what we are saying is that Satan being bound is a figurative way of expressing restraint and control is given um, to Satan that he does not deceive the nations. Notice there's a specific reference here made to the purpose for the binding of Satan. Satan is being bound that he will not deceive the nations. What do we mean by the nations? Usually when the nations are used in reference in the, in the, in the, in the word, it refers to the Gentile nations, the non-Jew nations. And prior to Jesus' coming, the, 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 the word of God was, was basically confined to the Jewish nation. Remember Jesus saying he came to, the, to, the, to his own and they received him not. So the Gentile nations basically did not um, worship God. They, they worshiped idols. They were involved in paganism. And, the, and the, the righteous standard of God was basically established among the Jewish people. Satan deceived the nations into being um, alienated from God and being connected to paganism and idolatry. Came through the Babylonian Empire, the Medio Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, right down to the Romans. Those people were worshippers of paganism, of pagan practices and idolatry. They were worshipping other gods and other deities, not Yahweh, that the Jews were taught to worship and which they served. They were deceived by Satan. When Christ came, the focus was no longer now on the Jewish nation because the gospel was extended to the nations, to the Gentiles. And even in the, the great commission that the disciples were given, go ye into all the world and teach all nations, the Gentile nations. The word, the gospel spread to the Gentile nations. It started at Jerusalem. And remember Jesus said, you shall remember it's in Jerusalem and in Judea and in the uttermost parts of the world. So the gospel being spread to the nations took place during the first advent of Jesus and Satan was restricted at that time. Prior to the coming of Jesus Christ, the, the, the word was confined basically to the Jewish nation. So what we are saying is, and what the understanding could be from, from this, is that Satan was restricted from allowing the gospel to spread from the first advent of Christ until that period comes to an end. So it is not literally a thousand years. It could be 1,500, 2,000, 2,500, but it will continue until Christ returns. But it says that Satan will be loose for a little season, as we saw here, and then he will go out again to bring deception. But right now, Satan cannot stop the gospel from being spread. As a matter of fact, from the time Jesus came and established his kingdom, and give the word to the disciples, and they carried it to the Gentiles, Satan was not able to stop the gospel from being spread to the nations. The deception that they had was now released. Remember, remember Paul uh, speaking to Ephesians says, but at one time you were strangers, you were aliens, but now you have the gospel, you are exposed to the word, you now become not foreigners anymore, but you become heirs of the kingdom. And a lot of the teaching in the New Testament is an indication that since the gospel reached the Gentiles, we were then able to become partakers of God's um, divine promises. 
So that's how we see that thousand year period representing the binding of Satan. Now, how could we look at that figuratively? Remember Jesus said, um, before you enter the strong man's house, you first have to bind him. That's in Matthew um, chapter 12, verse 28 and 29. We can, we can look at that. Matthew chapter 12, verse 28 and 29. Matthew 12. And we could read from a little further up because remember Jesus was cast out spirits and, and the, um, the Pharisees were accusing him by, by performing this in, in, in the name of Beelzebub. And we can pick up for verse 25. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, every kingdom, is divide, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. And how then shall his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they cast, they, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else how can one enter a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house. Now obviously he's referring to Satan there and he's talking about binding Satan. Is he literally talking about binding Satan? No, he isn't. It's a figurative expression of bringing some control and restraint over Satan's power in the life of an individual. And what what Revelation is, is, is showing us here is that Satan has been restrained in a way from allowing the gospel to reach the nations and, re, and reach the Gentiles, which was the case before. Remember Isaiah in the prophet says, the people who were in darkness have seen a great light. He's referring to the nations that were in darkness. Their eyes were, were darkened by Satan's influence, had them being Polyist, polytheistic and worshiping other deities and be involved in paganism and idolatry. But light came to them through the gospel and over that period of time, Satan was restrained in a way. Now the same word, incidentally, that is used for binding here, used in Matthew, which Jesus uses, is the same Greek word used for the binding of Satan in Revelation 20. So we are not then talking about a chain and a, and, a, and, a pay, and a key to enclose Satan. He's not like a genie put away and then at a point in time you open the lid and out he comes. No, it is, his power is restrained and restricted but there is going to come a time when the Bible says for a little season, which means before Christ returns, Satan is going to go out again to bring deception to the world. To the Gentile nations again. And that's where you will see later in Revelation, he amasses an army. Now, when we get to, to do the battle of Armageddon, we will understand what this involves. He amasses an army to bring an attack against God's people. It's not literally Israel and a battle of Armageddon to attack the Israelites. It's Satan again going out to attack God's people just before the end because he recognizes his time is short. The Bible says so. And he's going to go to amass all the power he can through false prophets, through false teachings, through a whole lot of things that we are beginning to see in our world. So there are some theologians from the Amillennial group who believe that we may have already begun the little season because we're seeing a rise of atheism, we're seeing a rise of homosexuality, and we're seeing a whole lot of things getting into the church we're seeing a whole lot of antagonism against Christians. We're seeing a lot of religious groups coming against Christians. We're seeing governments coming against Christians and what they stand for. Um, um, we're seeing a whole lot of systems working against Christianity and what we stand for. So there are some um, schools of thought that 
that believe that we have already begun to see that little season begin, which means we don't know how long the season is. But compared to the restraint that was exercised over that period mentioned as a thousand years, the season is going to be much shorter. So Satan is not going to have dominance um, for any long period of time over influencing the nations um, to come against the church. So that's where we see the figurative interpretation coming in here. Now you tell me what you think. So we don't see Satan literally bound because we are comparing it to the passage of scripture mentioned in Matthew. And there are other passages of scripture which we're not going to go through all of them, but you can make a note of them. John chapter 12, verse 31 and 32. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 15. You look at those. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. Those are passages explaining the restraining of Satan from being able to accomplish his purpose of, of trying to subdue the, the spread of the gospel across the world. So we are in that period all in now, meaning that the thousand year period started from the first advent of Christ, the establishment of his kingdom and the spread of the gospel through his message and through the message of the disciples which he would have left, reach across the Roman Empire to a lot of Gentile nations. And that period of time extends right down to our time where the gospel is being preached, reaching nations all over the world. It perhaps have not reached, reached every ethnic group as yet, but Satan could not restrict the gospel. That's what is referring to. Now, tell me what you think about the interpretation so far from those couple of verses. Can you accept a figurative interpretation? Do you accept that the thousand year period might not be restricted to actually a thousand years, but it's an extended time period during which Satan's power is restrained? Now, let me say that the, the premillennials argue that how can we say that Satan is restricted and yet there is still sin, yet there is still evil going on? If we, if we say that he's um, bound in a way. But the Bible does not say that Satan being bound means that there's an end to sin. It says that he is bound, that he cannot deceive the nations. And I just took the opportunity to explain what that meant. And if you read the, the passages that I um, would have given you, that speaks about Satan's control. But he's still as a roaring lion. Jesus says that he came to destroy the works of the devil. But were people possessed during Jesus' time? Sure they were. Wasn't there evil during Jesus' time? So destroy does not mean that he's completely absent from activity. He is still acting. He's still active, but he is restrained. And destroy means that Jesus will put an end to the control and the authority of, of the power of Satan in, in individuals' lives who allow Christ to exercise control in their lives. And once they allow him to bind the strong man, they will get the release and the freedom to serve God. So even though Jesus talks about destroying the works of the devil, we do not see a complete destruction of the enemy while Jesus was on earth, and we do not see a complete eradication of, of Satan's influence. The scripture does not in, um, intend to give that impression. What it does intend to, to explain to us is that there is a restraining power exercised over the devil from preventing the gospel reaching the nations that were once in darkness and are exposed to the light. And that is still being continued as as we spread the gospel, as missionaries go out, as the Bible society distributes Bibles, the gospel is spreading across the world and Satan cannot stop it. He cannot prevent it. That is what the binding is referring to. He's literally being restrained 
from preventing the gospel from reaching the nations and deceiving right. people. Yes. Yes, Reverend Jackman. Uh -huh. All right, more well, question. I see now I can make. Now, mm -hmm. if, if, if the God, you say just directly true, the gospel is being preached. If the if the gospel, the gospel is being preached and yes. people are being saved, that would you say that that puts Satan's kingdom in jeopardy? Yes, it does. It puts Satan, <laughs> Satan's kingdom in jeopardy because you see, it, it's one kingdom against another. Satan has a kingdom. His kingdom is referred to as the kingdom of darkness. When we get saved as a result of the gospel, we are translated from the kingdom of darkness. We are pulled out of Satan's kingdom into Christ's kingdom, the kingdom of light, which is an established kingdom. So if you if you wanted to argue that the kingdom of God is not a present reality, but then where are people being translated from the kingdom of darkness? They are coming into a spiritual kingdom, which has already been established. You see, an attempt to literalize the Bible. And when we look at some of the passages in the Old Testament, which they are using to support the millennium, we will see that these were scriptures which were prophesying of the, the, the advent of Christ and the establishment of a spiritual kingdom and not the literal millennial kingdom that they are seeing. That's where they make the error because of the, the, um, the intense desire to interpret the Bible literally. You can't. There, there is too much figurative language in the Bible for you to be looking for literal interpretation and you will miss the truth if you do not recognize that there's figurative and symbolic language, which means something different. Now, there's another right, point I want to make. If you have, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I have something to because you remember in the book of Acts, after the Pentecost, yes, then Peter spoke, and three thousand souls were added. Yes. And then at the gate of Beautiful, then they did after that they did this miracle with the man, and then there were told not to preach in the name of Jesus. Now, yes. you would notice then that these people being saved is an indication now that there were Gentiles coming into the kingdom of God. So the authorities now, they got fixed with Peter, James, and John and the others, and they chapter mm -hmm. four challenged them not to preach. Yes. And then they, then they preach again, 5,000 souls were added to the kingdom of God. That Correct. means that Satan kingdom now started to crumble and then say right. and then the persecution now from the same Romans came against the church. That's right. And and the church was scattered. And there goes the gospel again. R remember again, taking the whole picture, Satan is trained through the Roman Empire, through false prophets, through all forms of deception that he wants to use to restrict the kingdom of God from expanding and spreading. Remember, Daniel saw a little stone that became a large mountain. That's the kingdom of God. It started from small, but from the inception in Roman, in, in Revelation 12, Satan tried to attack the church and subdue it through Roman influence. They, they even tried to, to, to restrict the, the news of the resurrection of Jesus and were paying people, the Romans, to tell lies about the resurrection. They wanted to restrict the spreading of the gospel. They tried to control the disciples and told them don't speak in another name. They were imprisoned, they were beaten, they were flogged. But you see, Satan could not stop the, the, the spreading of the gospel. That's the restraining impact that it had on the, the kingdom of, of, of darkness. And, and that's what we, we are saying is the representation of Satan being bound, bound or restricted from, from the gospel going forth to the nations that were once in darkness. And the truth and the, of the, rea and the reality is, is that all the gentle nations were in darkness. They were, they were pagan worshippers. Even when Paul went to Athens, he saw all sorts of images to unknown deities. Paganism was all across the world until the gospel started to reach them. It was only the Jews that understood Yahweh's purpose and calling through the promise that God had made to Abraham and bless his seed. But, but, but righteousness and godliness was confined to the nation of Israel. All the other nations were basically in darkness. Now, if you happen to get connected to a Jew and you became a proselyte and you got converted, you, you then 
got access to, to um to their blessings, but but basically on a large scale, the Gentile nations were, were deceived by Satan into false beliefs and 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 on all of those things. So yes, I can see that this is what John is really saying here: a restriction and a, and, a, and, a, and a spread of the gospel. Now, what they say is that when Christ comes back, he's going to literally reign on a throne and that David will be his vice president. That's what they say. So David and Jesus are going to be reigning on a throne together. But, but if you go back to what Nathan told David in, in, I think it was 2 Samuel, he said, David, when you are dead, God will raise up your seed. God will raise up an offspring out of your lineage that will establish a kingdom that will last forever when you are dead. So if 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 the prophecy coming from Nathan is saying that, that Christ's kingdom will be established when David is dead, how then can you come and tell me that Christ will come and set up a kingdom and reign with David, literally, and David is alive? No, that is not what the scripture said. That is a is a is a is a is an opposition to what the word is saying. So you see, you're going to get these these variations in, in their theology when you look at the whole picture. All right, so we can we can move on. Just one more question, sir. Just yes, one, one more, more question. question. Yes, I had I had here as I was looking at some stuff. I had here. Now, would you say that the church has the power to loose and to bind? But yes, because Jesus, Jesus has given us the keys. Remember he said he has given us the keys? Now that's why I tell you that key is not a literal thing. So don't expect here that in John, that there will, the angel come over with a key to lock up Satan anywhere. The key is a symbol of authority. And Jesus says he has given us the keys. We have authority on earth. Yes, given to us by Jesus to bind and loose. Paul through the power of the Holy Spirit, was able to loose a girl that was demon-possessed, that people were making gain from. So, so, so the, the loosing and, and, and the binding is exercising control and authority over the things that, that Satan perhaps would have imprisoned people in. So yes, Christians, the church, I know not everybody would be able to exercise the same authority because remember again, we have different gifts and different manifestations. Stations, and all Christians are not going to exercise the same power and authority, but the church has that power and authority, and Christ will exercise it through um, different individuals whom he will empower to exercise the authority to bind and to loose. Not everybody will lay hands and cast out demons, but it's an authority that's given to the church. And, 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 and God, at times, can choose any individual he wants to, to exercise that authority through. So while it may not be your giftedness, it does not mean that at some point in time, Christ can allow you to lay hands on somebody, Randy, and they receive healing and, and get up and, and, and walk if they were crippled or, or lay hands on somebody who might be demon-possessed and, and the demon is cast out, of course. But that exercise of authority is, is given by Jesus and his disciples went out and exercised that authority and Jesus told them, don't rejoice about the authority you have. You better rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So at the end of the day, the, 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 the most important thing is not the exercise of, of, of giftedness and the exercise of authority manifested in these different ways, but to know that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Because Jesus says, many will come in the last day saying, Lord, but did I cast out demons in your name? Did I do this in your name? And he said, I never knew you. So we have, to, we have to maintain a connection, an intimate relationship with Christ that is more important than any giftedness that we might have in terms of authority. So yes, Randy, the church has given authority to do specific things which attacks Satan's kingdom. All right, we proceed. And I saw three thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, 
neither had received his mark upon their forehead or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. Watch this. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go forth, watch this again, to deceive the nations. That's what he was bound for in that thousand year period, which is an extensive period that we are part of all in out. But now you say, and he shall go forth to deceive the nations, which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog. We're going to learn more about that when we come to look at the Battle of Armageddon. We're not going to discuss that any detail tonight because it will carry off. To gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Now we're going to we're going to pause here because we have to go through this in little sections and unpack it. Now. Usually when you see the prefacing mark, I saw thrones. I saw thrones. That is mentioned about 42 um, times in Revelation where the mention of thrones. And wherever you see the mention of thrones, it is not referring to earthly thrones. It is referring to a heavenly experience or heavenly thrones. So when the premillennists read this, they are saying that we are literally going to be reigning on thrones with Jesus on earth. And saints are going to be given authority and rule in different parts of the world as exercising authority that, that Christ has given to them. So we are going to be reigning with Christ literally and exercising authority and judging the nations in a literal sense on earth during that thousand year period physically and literally now watch carefully now the bible does not mention a reign on earth notice that carefully i indicated you before watch what the bible says and what it does not say there is no mention of a reign on earth here and watch the people who are reigning look at it carefully john said and i saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was given to them and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast now is he seeing living people here on earth or is he seeing disembodied souls that are, are on thrones in the heavenly realm what Think you because it is an important interpretation. Now, I want before you answer to, to carry you back to chapter six because remember we said that Revelation has a number of themes and a number of visions. There are about 60 different visions or a, a few more in Revelations. And, and these visions speak about specific things at specific times and they do not always necessarily follow one after the other. The tendency to think, and I saw, makes people believe that it's a continuation of something that is following from the previous chapter. That is not always the case. And I saw could pick up a different vision with a different theme. And we have to bear that in mind. And even in Revelation chapter 20, you're going to see the word, and I saw, the words, and I saw a number of times, and I saw, and he's speaking of specific things and developing specific themes then you see the phrase, and I saw. So you got to remember that. Chapter six, we're going to pick up from verse eight. And I beheld, sorry, and I looked and beheld a pale horse. I remember in Revelation, you're going to see, I saw or I heard. Very often you will see John say, I saw something or I heard something many times in the book of Revelation. And his name that sat 
on it was death, and hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with be beasts of the earth. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw, watch this carefully, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. Same souls that John is speaking about in Revelation 20. He is talking about here in chapter 6. Now, are we following Revelations in a chronological sequence from 6 down? No, we aren't. He's picking up the same theme in Revelation 20 that he's mentioned here of who he saw. He saw under the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and free and true, sorry, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? They're asking God, so where are they? They are in heaven. They are disembodied spirits. They are people who were martyred for Christ. And I'll and I show you how we, we can look at this symbolically. All right? That you, you understand where the, the, the text is, 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 is going and what is trying to help us to understand. And robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were, should be killed as they were. So we are dealing with people who were martyred for the sake of, of the gospel. So John is seeing in Revelation 20, as he saw in, in Revelation um, um, chapter 6, people who were martyred for the sake of the gospel, who did not take the mark of the beast who did not follow the world system, who were not controlled by the things of the world, who followed Christ and his teaching, who gave their testimony, and who were under the control by the blood of the Lamb, they died for the sake of the gospel. So John is not seeing people reigning on earth with Christ in the millennium. John is seeing Christians that were martyred. You see, remember, John is getting a revelation of things that the church will go through from its inception until the time of the end. And John is seeing Christians that will be killed for the sake of the gospel. And even in our time, there are going to be people that will be martyred for the sake of the gospel. And there were a number of people in the first century of the church that were martyred, thousands of them in the early centuries of the church. There were a number of them martyred during the, the, um, the, the, the reign of the Roman Catholic Church in the Inquisitions. And, and so John is seeing these people reigning with Christ. So when we speak about reigning, we speak about a physical reign in heaven with, 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 with the, um, the saints that have died. And we also see a spiritual reign of Christians who have received Christ as their Lord and Savior and reigning with him spiritually. But let's look at the ones that were martyred. Remember Jesus said um, to the thief on the cross, today you shall be with me in paradise. This is a man that was going to be crucified with Jesus. He's going to die. But yet he is going to live in a disembodied spirit in heaven, in paradise, really, I should say. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection of life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So you, you, you are martyred physically. Remember what Paul said? To be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Christians are reigning with Christ in heaven with, within their disembodied spirit. The soul was not killed. The body was. And so they are reigning in paradise with Christ. And that is what John is seeing. He is not seeing people physically and literally reigning on the earth. It did not say that. And it was made clear here in that passage in comparison. And we have scriptural references to indicate that we, and, and then remember the story of Davies and Lazarus. Lazarus was in the bosom of Abraham. He was dead, but spiritually alive. 
And that's what Jesus is basically is teaching us when, when he's uh, 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 that verse that we quote very often at funerals. Though he were dead yet, shall, uh, shall, he, shall he live? So that's what John was seeing here. And, and then we have a blessing for those who have part in the first resurrection. So we now have to look at the, the concept of the resurrection because we have a physical resurrection and a spiritual resurrection. We have a physical death and a spiritual death. These are concepts which we have to pick up and understand. Remember I told you we can't get to Revelation in one night. It's too deep and there's, there's too much you have to unravel to get the whole context of what the Bible is teaching us. Now, if according to Paul, people receive immortal bodies, incorruptible bodies, after the resurrection, why are you going to bring people back to live on the earth for a thousand years when Christ returns? A question has been asked. Why is there a need for a thousand year reign on the earth physically when immediately after that, eternity is going to be set in and God's eternal kingdom is going to be, to be set up? What is the significance? What is the need for this physical reign on earth for a thousand years where people are going to be living and planting crops and building buildings and people getting children and, and all of those things? And how they interpret the, the language in, in the Old Testament, which we look at, the land laying down with the lamb. The lion eating straw like the ox. We are going to look at some of those passages and see that they are not literally meant to be speaking about a millennium and a, a, a utopian world. They are passages that were meant to speak of Christ's kingdom, which was going to be established when he came at his first advent. And you are going to provide a lot of complication if you look at a physical millennium because you're going to have issues with the people who do not have immortal bodies you're going to have issues with people who are not controlled by Christ which means that they're still going to be sinning because if you're going to have people being saved during the millennium it means that they're sinning how can you have a perfect utopian world where they still sin and if the devil is supposed to be bound as you think in your millennium why are people still going to be committing sin and things that you, you have to then sort of connect to make your theology one that is biblical and that's where we have issues. So we're going to be looking um, in our next session at, at the first resurrection and the second resurrection. The first death and the second death. The Bible does not mention a, a second resurrection. It mentions here the first resurrection but the second is implied. It mentions the second death further down, but it does not mention the first death, but obviously it will have to be implied. If you have a first or second, sorry, you have going to have a first. And we, we have now to understand what those um, terms mean and how they connect to the teaching of the word. Is there a physical and a spiritual for both of them? I say yes, and we need to understand how they would apply to what John is seeing in Revelation 20 and what the Bible is trying to teach us. So let me summarize what we've looked at so far. The binding of Satan is not a literal binding because Satan is a spirit and you are not going to put a chain around a spirit being and drop him in a hole and lock him up with a key. That never meant to be taken literally. We are dealing with a book of symbols and figurative language. That's what it is. The binding of Satan for a thousand years is not a literal thousand years. It's a time reference, which is not specific, which we believe extends from Christ's first advent and the establishment of his kingdom until he returns again, whenever that time will be. Satan, during that time period, which we are no part of, still part of, was restrained from allowing the gospel to reach the Gentile nations that were in darkness prior to Christ's coming, because the, the righteousness of God and, and the, 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 the belief in, in Yahweh and his teachings were basically confined to the Jews as a nation, as a people. But they rejected it, and, and the gospel reached the Gentiles, and we saw all of that when we look at Jesus' teaching from Matthew chapter 24. 
And so Satan could not prevent that and the gospel is still going out. There will come a time when he will be loose again for a season, meaning that he will have no more retort authority and the restraint now will not be on him as such. And we will wonder why that is the case, but we're not discussing that right now. But he will go again to try to deceive people and prevent them from entering into the kingdom of God. And watch very carefully for what is happening in our world because, as I said, there is the belief that we might right now be in that season that has started. How long is it going to extend? The Bible does not give us a specific time, it says a season. And it does not mean a, a season of a three month period, literal season. It means a relatively shorter time than that thousand year period mentioned by John. So it could be 20, 30, 40, 50. Who knows how long it's going to be before Christ then returns and brings an end to Satan, the false prophet, the Antichrist, and all of those that oppose the kingdom of God. And remember the promises, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. So Satan was trained from Revelation chapter 12. And down in 20, he will get defeated. And the new kingdom will be established as we see in 21 and 22. And Satan will be a defeated foe. That's the theme overall of Revelation. That Christians have a hope to hold on to. That we will be persecuted, we will be tried, we will be tested, but we will come out as a church triumphant because the gates of hell cannot prevail. So I will pause at that point. It's nine o'clock, but I still give you an opportunity for a few questions. Remember, keep reading it over, keep analyzing it in your mind. We got a, a number of, of other parts to, to go before we get to the end of, of chapter 20. And remember, we have to look back at some of the Old Testament passages that they're using to support a millennium. So we, we have at least another full session to go in understanding the concept of the millennium and the teaching um, connected to it. But if you have any queries at this point or anything that you want to say, I will um, give you the opportunity before um, Jeff close off the session. Uh, Reverend Chapman, can you run those um, scriptures on us again that you give us to read? Um, you mean for Satan? For Satan, be, Satan being bound? Yes. Yeah, John 12, 31 to 32. And obviously these are going to give you some spiritual implications of what it means for Satan to be bound. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hebrews Excellent. chapter 2, 14 to 15. I read for you the one Matthew 12, 28 to 29. You can write that down and you can look back over it. And this was Jesus himself speaking. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. And Colossians 2, 15. They, they explain the whole concept of of, of control and restraint exercise over the adversary and it's not a literal tying up or chaining up of Satan but a restriction of his power to prevent um, God's purpose for his kingdom Thank you Reverend Jackman Yes sir Yes, Just one query Bang yes. bang right here and I saw the souls that were beheaded Yes no. No, history says that a lot of our church fathers, they yes. were beheaded mm -hmm. and because they and they because they fail to accept what what um that's that system at that time right. was yes. offering them and right. they reject they rejected the 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 system based on scripture. And that right. is why there would was beheaded. Yes. No, no. I mean, I mean, you you also spoke about Satan intensifying his um activities when it comes to the last time, when it 
Yes, yes, yes. The last days, right? Prior to Christ's return, yes. My, my, my thing would be, is it possible mm -hmm. that we would see an occurrence of what the early church martyrs suffer in our time? Yes. Rem remember Jesus said that we shall be hated of all nations for his name's sake. Remember that. We shall be hated by all nations for his name's sake. In other words, there's going to be a global move. John saw it here. John saw it here in this same Revelation 20 when he says Satan, after he's loose, goes about to gather the nations against God's people. It's not literal Jerusalem. It's spiritual Jerusalem. He is gathering all the power he can. And yes, I believe that it's going to be a universal attempt coming against the church. Now, we could be around. Who knows? Because we do not know how long that, that thousand year period extends. Now, we, are, we were saying for a long time, Jesus is coming soon. Now, we don't know that's next 20 years, the next 50 years. We cannot calculate the time because we can't figure out the calendar. And God has not given us a specific time period anyhow. But what I'm saying is that coming close, and when Satan recognizes that his time is short, he's loose for a little season. So that is not going to be a very long period. And he's going to go all out to amass a, a campaign against the church. And what I'm saying, I would agree with some of those theologians who are saying that we could be on the threshold or the beginning of that loose season from what we are seeing around the world in terms of how people are viewing Christians, attacking Christians, um, sort of despising Christians. Christianity and what we stand for and coming up with all sorts of false teachings and, and things that would alienate people from serving God and the persecution that we are getting. And we are not aware of it in our locality here, but, but there is a lot of persecution going on across the world against Christians. And yes, we are going to see martyrdom again for the sake of the gospel. And while I don't believe that there's a specific seven-year tribulation, which they assign to that week in Daniel, I don't believe that. The Bible never mentioned a, a specific period of tribulation for seven years. There's no mention of it in the Bible. That's an interpretation. I believe that coming on to the, the closing of, of the dispensation, that we are going, we are going to see serious tribulation in the world. I believe that. And it's going to be a lot of it against the, the, the church. And not taking the mark of the beast may not, not bow into the system. Because remember, these same people here that lost their lives, Brandy, were people who didn't take the mark, who didn't bow to the system, who didn't bow to the traditions and the culture, who didn't give way to, to the paganism and, 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 the, um, and the idolatry. They did not take the mark. They stood for Christ. And we will get that sort of persecution by standing for Christ. Price. And when you think, yes. When, even when you go back to Daniel, if you study Dan, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, yes. they stood up too for principle and That's they right. did not accept what the, the, the people in Babylon were offering at that time. So hence, they, they were persecuted too. Right. And that, that's another illustration of a type of what we're dealing with. In Babylon, facing the culture and the system, they wanted them to bow down to the image, to be idolatrous and to be pagan. Those boys say no. And even if we lose our lives, we will go in the den or we will go in the fire, but we are not going to bow. That's, that, in essence, it means they did not take the mark. They did not bow to the beast. Not in a literal sense, but figuratively, they did not give up their faith that they had in God. They stood the test of time, and God delivered them. True. As he will for anybody who takes the stand. Some will die. Yes. All were not delivered like the Hebrew boys were delivered. Some will die for the sake of the gospel. But that's that's in God's hand. And the question has been asked early in Revelation, who will stand? I think it's in Revelation chapter 7. Who will stand? When all these things begin to unfold, uh, we see the peril that is going to come in the world because let me tell you, Revelation unfold some, some, some disasters that are going to come on this world as a form of a judgment 
for rebelling against the, the, the kingdom of God. Just like the Jews were judged for rejecting the Messiah and the prophets and saw the destruction of the temple and the overrunning and thousands of them being killed by the Romans. I am saying that we are going to see this, the judgment of God on this world for people who are rebelling against God and the, and the standard that God is trying to establish. The world is going to suffer as a result of it. And we are going to be part of that. That's why I believe God is not going to snatch us out of these things that will be coming on the world. We are going to be part of it, but God will preserve us in it. Some of us, yes, will die as a result. But when we die, we are still alive in Christ. In the disembodied world, waiting then to return to the final consummation and the establishment of the eternal kingdom. That's, that's who Jude saw, the 10,000 of the saints coming back. And Daniel said he saw 10,000 times 10,000 around the throne. All of those are Christians that would have died and gone to be in paradise waiting for the return where they will be reunited with their bodies. That's the whole picture, folks. And we, and we can just study the word and see it. And that's how it's going to unfold. There's, there's not two different comings, two different resurrections. There's going to be one general resurrection, one. And everything will come to an end, as Paul says, um, when Christ delivers up the kingdom, he says everything will come to an end and the last enemy, death, will, 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 will be destroyed. So the premillennial teaching is, is a distraction from the, the, the truth of the word. I think it's a, it's a, it's a, a bad um, theology. So Rev, um, yes. someone is asking someone Galaxy Tab. So we are constantly asking persons to indicate, but Galaxy yes. Tab is asking. So are you saying the mark of the beast is not a literal thing? I am saying the mark of the beast is not a literal thing because we, we also see Revelation. I will point out to you when we come a little further in, in the study that you talk about people having a mark or a seal of, of crisis as well. So do we have a literal mark? Revelation talk about a mark um, of, of God on, on the forehead. The 144,000 had the mark and the seal of God. Was, were you talking about a mark here of people? Do we, are we talking about a literal 144,000? The people of God are marked. They are sealed. We don't have anything on our hands or on our forehead. That is not literal. And I don't think, in, in, in essence, that we're going to see a world where people have a mark on their forehead and on their hands. I do not think, as I indicated, that's literal. I think it's meant to be a figurative expression. The, the head and the forehead being the control of your thought. That's where the most of your activity and thought pattern um, and brain processing goes on. And, and uh, uh, Christ can either control that or the devil. Our hands are what we are engaged in our actions and our activities, what we do. So... You either are going to be controlled by Satan's system and think and act as he wants, or you're going to be controlled by Christ's power in Christ's kingdom and think and act as he wants. And those who do not think and act like Satan wants them to, as Christians, will, will be persecuted for it. It's happened before, and it will continue to happen, and we will get in a world where, as I said, there is going to be universal antagonism against the church. Jesus said it, and it is going to happen again. And we will be part of the persecution for not taking the mark. In other words, not bowing to the system, not giving away, giving away, sorry, to the things that they are demanding of, of, of Christians to do and to be engaged in. Because we will already have the mark and the seal of God, which is the Holy Spirit and the word and obedience to his commands. Those are the people who don't take the mark. Those people who obey the word of God, as you will see in the same revelation, and stick to the commandments that God have identified. Those are the people who don't take the mark. So there's no literal mark that anybody will be stamped with. I don't believe that. There's no chip, I believe, that will be put into your body to identify you uh, with people not having a mark or having a mark. I believe it's a spiritual reality. Not that people won't put chips in you for their own purposes, but I don't believe that that is what um, the word intends for us to understand. It's not bowing to the system and to the pressures of the world which are anti-Christ or anti-Christian. But serving God faithfully and be prepared to die for it. 
And I hope that that is the understanding that we also are getting from Revelation, that we have to be prepared to die like, like these martyrs have for the sake of the gospel. That's the high calling that we have. Not everyone might have to die for the sake of the gospel, but we have to be prepared that if we have to, that we make that choice. I'm not going to bow to the image and to the beast. I'm going to take a stand for Christ, come what may. That's what John is encouraging us to do because we're going to be victorious in the end. Uh, Rev, um, yes. Well, Galaxy Tab is Minister Colleen Phillips. So thank you, Minister Colleen. Um, we know who that is. Um, the, at one point, there was a big fanfare about the vaccine, and the vaccine was seen as the mark of the beast, and, and yeah. persons were, were toting that. Um, <laughs> That's false theology. <laughs> That's false theology. Okay. Uh, I, so I suppose that would put to bed um, a person's, because it, at one point it was rampant. I mean, everybody saying, oh, the, the, the vaccine is the, the mark of the beast. And, yeah, you, and see, you see, again, Jeff, because people are looking for a literal application of what we are reading in Revelation. So we are watching in news headlines, we are watching what are, are, are things that are current, and we're trying to make a literal application to a whole lot of things. So we, we, we jump on things, and, and we were hearing about other marks before. When, when we had the barcode, people were saying that that's going yeah. to be mark of the beast. Mm -hmm. You understand? So we look at the jump on any literal thing we can find. I don't believe that, in, in really, in essence, it's going to be like that. It, 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 is, it is a spiritual um, reality of what we're going to experience in terms of standing for Christ and opposing the system that will be set up um, against, against Christians. But we will discuss a little more on that. I see at least you're, you, you, you're getting some thoughts on it coming on to the end. I hope we will get those at the beginning when it open up for discussion. <laughs> but thank you very much for, for engaging at this time. And we want to close off the session because it's it's 9.15. But I do enjoy. I mean, if you want to go to 10 o'clock, I will go. But, but we, we have to be moderate. <laughs> We have to be temperate in all things. And there are people who would not want to go that time. But, you know, it's good for the engagement. But please, when I give you the, the early time, take that opportunity that we can talk and dialogue and use up that time and not have to then incorporate it towards the end. But I appreciate the, the late um, comments and questions that come. So God bless you from me. Have a good night. and looking forward to seeing you next week again. Maybe try to unravel the other sections of Revelation chapter 20.